Amen. If you would, go and take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. The Gospel of John, chapter 9. Gospel of John, chapter 9. We're going to start with reading verses 1 through 12. And when you get there, just say, Amen. Amen. Touch that person beside you and say, Jesus loves you. Now the person beside you say, Stop touching me. And I know. That's brotherly love, man. Uh, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. And this is what happened in the days and times of Jesus. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received my sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the testimony of the man who was born blind. I thank you for the Savior who came into his life and gave him sight. And Father, I thank you for the Savior who is still in our lives, who wishes the blind to see, and those who cannot hear to hear, and those who cannot feel and experience God to feel and experience his presence. God, I pray that you would move me aside and let the very Spirit of Jesus minister to every heart and mind here. God, that we may, as one, respond to your word and make a difference in this world. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and our Lord. Amen. How many of y'all like that game, Hide and Seek? Any of y'all? Amen. Uh, well, some of us are really good at it. Uh, some of us are not, not so much. I love when I play with my, my little ladies. Uh, Allie, the younger one, she would hide, and then she would say, Come and find me, Dad! No, I'm right here, Dad! No, not over there, over here. I mean, it's just so adorable because, you know, and Kate, she would just hide. And I could not, it'd take me three days to find her. You know, that's com- com- completely different. You know, I'd have to say, where are you to, to find her? But when I was a kid, I had two older brothers. They're uh, nine years and 11 years older than me. And I had a younger sister. And so when, and occasionally when mom and dad would go out, like on a date or go shopping, and it was late at night, my brothers would flip the breaker off and it'd be pitch black in the house. And we would have the most amazing game of hide and seek. We did a lot of screaming. <laughs> they did a lot of scaring on us, right? You know, we had like the, just the best time, but it's completely dark. And the thing about it is, is you kind of know where your room is and all that. And you kind of have an idea because you can't see and, and you know where things are at so you won't run into a wall. Well, uh, we had rearranged our room and when we play that game all the time, I would run to my bed and jump on it. Well, we rearranged the room. It was pitch black, and it ran, and I jumped soaring on my bed, and floor. I ate the floor. And then every sibling has always said this, don't you tell mom when you get hurt. Amen? Don't tell mom. Right? Well, I, I kind of, I think many of us wouldn't really have an understanding of someone who was born blind. I don't think many of us would, unless you've lived that, unless you were in those shoes, you wouldn't have an understanding of not being able to see anything and have no idea what things look like at all. 
And I love this account because we have this man right here. He spent his entire life unable to see in, in blindness, in darkness. You know, when, before everything began, God came on the scene and he created light. He said, let there be light. Amen. And not only did he bring light, because in the absence of light, in the absence of God, there is darkness. Not only did he bring light and his presence, but he also brought substance. He created something. He made something beautiful, and it was wonderful, and everything was perfect and awesome. And God does this, the same thing in our, in our, in our lives. You, many of us don't understand or realize, but before God, we're walking in darkness. Before God, we are, are walking in a partial truth. We, we haven't seen the fullness of God. But God wants to come into your life and not only bring life, but he wants to bring what? Substance. He wants to fill you with his presence and his knowledge and understanding. And before you ever go any further with God, there's something very important you must understand, is you must read this. This is so important. Uh, God's word helped open my eyes. That I could understand that there was a different way of thinking. That there was a different way of being and living. I had to read God's word for myself to see that there is a different path in life than just what we're given. Just what we've been given. Uh, Y'all remember the Amani Malele Children's Choir when they came over? Uh, some of the adult workers tell me that they absolutely love bringing their children from this country to America. Because they have to understand when they see for their eyes that there is a different way of living. You don't have to accept where you are. That there's a vision, there's possibility, there's dreams that you can have. That, that God can put in you and you can pursue and become something greater. This world will tear you down. God wants to put something, a substance inside of you that, that will make you a world conqueror. That you will conquer things in your life where you didn't think you could. You could get past storms that you didn't think it was possible because God has brought life into your life and substance. God wishes to do that. But you know what? Not everybody will see this light and not everybody will experience the presence of God because they're kind of blind. And there's lots of different types of blindness than just physical blindness. Uh, there is a spiritual blindness where we just can't see God. And you'll meet people like that. They're just spiritually blind. You can try to have a conversation about God with them, and they'll just kind of push back. Uh, matter of fact, you can tell them a miracle happened, and then they'll explain the miracle away somehow, that uh, it's not really a miracle. It's because of this and this and this. And they're just spiritually blind that they cannot have that conversation. They don't see it. Uh, some people, uh, which, ladies, is this true or not? Most of us guys, we have this thing called selective hearing. Bump the guy beside you because he wasn't even listening. It's called selective listening. Well, there's actually a thing called selective sight. You know what this is? When you see what you want to see. Amen? I think some of us are guilty of that. And then we have what, what I would call obscured vision, where there's just something in our way from experiencing or seeing what God really wants to show us and, and bring us to. But something that is obscuring your vision towards it. It says in Proverbs 29, 8, without vision, my people will what? Perish. Without prophecy, without revelation, my people throw restraint off, meaning that they'll run wild. And when you run wild, what happens? We get hurt. It says, happy are those who keep the law. Isaiah prophesied this in Isaiah 42, 16. I will lead the blind by a road they do not know. By paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These things are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. Matter of fact, one of my favorite things about VBS is saying the pledge, and it says, I will hide your word in my heart so that I may not sin against thee. Amen? Because your word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? A light unto my path. God's word reveals things, brings light and substance into our lives to make us more than what this world wants to turn us into. And if you really think that a lot of us, we try to fill this void inside with a lot of different meaningless things, a lot of things that just will not 
uh, lasts forever. God wants to instill inside of you something eternal, something beautiful, and it is light, it is love, it's forgiveness, it's mercy, it's grace, it's his presence, his holiness. God wishes to fill you, but many people miss it because they're blind in some way. That's why I love this account, because Jesus, in this moment when he brings light into this man's life, he reveals not just this man's blindness, but the blindness of everyone else around him. The blindness of the people who can actually see perfectly. And I'll, I love this account. Look at the first few verses with me. Look at what it says here. It says in, in verses 1 and 2, it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was born blind, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Well, this is absolutely such a curious question to me because the question is, who sinned, Jesus, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Listen, he was born blind, amen? Uh, and so I think anybody be have a really hard trouble of sinning before you're even born. Amen? Wouldn't you, don't you think you would have trouble? Some of you parents is like, well, not my kid, you know. But, uh, like, wouldn't you have trouble sinning before you're even born? But they're looking at this guy, and what we're seeing is uh, what we call the religious leader's interpretation of the law regarding the works of sin. All right? And, and so in that theology and in that thought process that they actually, some of them believe that if you lived a good life and you were blessed, that means you're in God's will. And if you were born in such a way or something terrible happens to you or you go through this thing and, 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 or sickness, that means that there is evidently sin in your life that you have not repented of and God is punishing you. And we see that in the Old Testament where, where some of the Pharisees would take these scriptures like Psalm 1.1. It says, those who do not go the way of the wicked are like trees planted beside the streams, and their, their roots are strong and healthy, but the wicked are like chafe in the wind. They are gathered and burned. And so in this interpretation, the righteous will be rewarded and the wicked will be punished. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that theology, but they would look at somebody who is just sick, or maybe who was born just a little different, and they would say, they have sin in their life. And listen, that's called judgment. And you should never judge others. At least you will what? Be judged. When we look at this passage of scripture, it reveals their mindset. And they're asking Jesus, well, who sinned? And, and Christians, what is awesome is the book right before Psalm 1 is the book of Job. Have you all heard of this story? Well, this guy was, was righteous. He did nothing wrong, but God let the devil test and tempt his heart. And the devil did everything he could to destroy this man from the inside out and the outside in, but he remained faithful. And Job had some awesome friends. How many of you have had just friends who were just such good encouragers? These three best friends, he, they traveled a long distance to sit with Job in his suffering, and they said, Job, you've sinned, man. Repent, and he'll heal you. And Job's like, I, I've done nothing wrong. I, I don't know why I'm being punished. Sin, uh, I mean, Job, it's because you've sinned. You, you need to repent. And Job had done nothing wrong. Do you know what? We live in a very sinful world. It's not just because of personal sins. It's because of this global darkness that we live in. And life can be very challenging and hard. We'll receive challenges in life because of the dark, broken world we live in. I remember when me and Jamie found out we were expecting uh, Kate, our, our first child. I remember I laughed and she cried. Amen. And then I, and then I cried. And then she laughed. Right? And it's just because it's so scary, you know? Uh, I, and I, I've always been like that with God. I'm like, God, are you seriously going to let me do this? I mean, I can't even take care of myself. Right? You're going to let me have just a beautiful child. And I remember being in the doctor's office and, and having different tests done as a standard test. And I remember them getting back to us and they said, uh, they, they called Jamie and said that our, our, our baby was going to have Down syndrome. And you know what? We, we took that in stride because you know what? God is the God of everything. And every life is his creation. We were hurt by that news and it scared us. But I remember us just sinking down in the hallway and praying, God, 
may your will be done. And, you know, Jamie and her, uh, looking for comfort, went to somebody, and, and that person told them, why don't you just abort that baby? It won't have a good life. And it, it hurt us. The Christians, some people think in those terms, those ways. But God has given us vision. He's given us sight. He's given us an understanding that every life that he creates has a purpose. You have a purpose. And it doesn't matter how the world looks at it. It doesn't matter because God, he breathes life and gives life. And you know, y'all have seen Kate run around. There's nothing absolutely wrong with her. There's nothing wrong with her. She gives me a lot of trouble, all right? But there's nothing wrong with her. Doctors don't know everything, but God does. Do you know what? If we wrote our stories, they would be so boring. Just think about this for one second. If we wrote our stories, they'd be so boring. Oh, I had a good life, had this and that, and everything went what? Perfect. But that's not life, is it? Matter of fact, God laughs at our plans. Amen? Because our plans fall so short to what God wants to bring us through and grow us through. How would we ever grow if we don't do, go through conflict? How would we ever grow in faith if it's not tested? Listen, Christians, God is our light. Jesus goes before us, and he will lead you through those testings and those conflicts that you'll have in life. And what we simply need to do is say, yes, Lord. We give the enemy a lot of power in our lives. But guess what? Do you know how much the power the enemy has over you? Just what you give him. Christ has true authority. And I love what Jesus says after this moment. He answers them. He says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be done and revealed in him. Amen? This means this, that this man was born in such a way for this moment to God reveal himself, not just to this man, but to others. And everybody is born with a purpose and a place in here, and that perfect revelation in which God uses a life to proclaim his glory in some way, shape, or form. And this man is sitting there day after day after day asking for alms, asking for help, and here comes the king of kings. And he's about to do a miracle in this man's life. And he has no idea it's coming. We'll look at verse 4. It says, but I, but I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am what? The light of the world. And Jesus, he says something so important for us to understand. Listen, when it's daytime, we work. Because the night is coming in which we cannot work. In those days, they didn't have power. They didn't have like modern lights. When the lights went out, they would go to bed so they could wake up early and do it all over again. Listen, Christians, our idea and frame of work is a little off. We could work all night these days, right? Your company may be completely okay with you pulling an all-nighter, amen? And they won't even pay you anymore, amen? Amen? Because they know you're dedicated, right? We'll work very hard. But Jesus says something so true Work while the day is here, for the night is coming. Jesus is speaking of his death. Because right now he's the light in the world, and he's going to be taken away. But fear not, for he is going to raise up people who will be light for him here. And you know who those people are? Us. Be light, for the night is still coming, Christians. Be light. Be God on this earth for others and show Christ's mercy and love because there are people just like this man born blind who are in desperate need to see God and experience him. And you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Go and minister. But look at what happens next. When he had said these things in verse 6, he spat in the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, we've got to visualize this, people. How many of y'all have ever made mud pies? Anybody mud pies? 
Oh yeah, lots of you. I had a friend, and her uh, daughter uh, was making mud pies, and uh, she would make the best ones, right? And she'd bring them to her mom, said, Here's, here mom, and she'd pretend to eat them, right? Because that's what any good parent would do. Well, she heard her daughter crying in the yard, and she ran, I was like, what's the matter? She goes, you lied, these are awful pies. They taste disgusting. <laughs> oh man. Jesus spat in the dirt and made clay, mud. And I've read different commentaries, and some are like, uh, Jesus, when he spat, it became holy spittle. <laughs> I mean, do you know how much he had to spit to make mud? I mean, that is a lot of spit. I know, I've done it, I'm a kid. He sat there, and he made mud, and he took it, and he asked this guy to stand in front of him, and he wiped it on his eyes. You try that at work sometime. It's not going to go well with you. And everybody's watching this. Why would Jesus, because you know what Jesus could do? He could just touch him, and he got his heel. Jesus could say, see, and he'd see. Jesus could do it like two or three football fields away. It's like, you can see now, and his eyes would be back. Because he's Jesus. He can do anything. He's amazing. But why did Jesus choose to spit on the ground and make mud and rub it in his eyes? Isn't that amazing? Everything he does has purpose. You know, the, uh, the healers of that day would make concoctions and salves and ointments and all these things. And you know, when you put water in dirt, what does it make? Mud. That's it. If you want to make a mud pie, what's the ingredients? Water and dirt. If you want to get fancy, you throw some rocks in it, right? Amen. There's no special thing about the mud and no special thing about the spit. Jesus was placing this man a responsibility. When he wiped that mud on his eyes, he told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. The healing didn't come from the mud or the spit. The healing came from the power of Christ. Healing always comes from the power of Christ. And very importantly, awesome things happen based upon our obedience because of the faithfulness of Christ. This man was obedient in listening to Jesus. He left from Jesus' side and went over and washed himself in that pool. Jesus created a moment where this man could be obedient to him and go and do what Jesus asked him to do. And listen, Christians, Jesus still calls the church to obedience. Jesus still sends us out into the world to be obedient and show faithfulness to him to bring healing in other people's lives. And it also made the Pharisees just so confused. How did this guy take mud and heal somebody with it? You and I, we could take that same mud, and do the same thing, and it would not work for us. The mud and the spit didn't change. It's like when God spoke to Moses, he said, Moses, take your shoes off for you're on what? Holy ground. But listen, the God, the God didn't change the ground. This man became aware of God's presence in his life, and it became holy, and he took his shoes off. Christians, we need to become aware of God's presence in our life daily so that we can see God's faithfulness happen in our lives. And he went, and he washed, and he could see again. And I want you to just imagine for a moment when he wipe that mud off of his eyes and he could see for the first time. Maybe he saw some friends he hadn't seen in a while and he looks at him like, whoa, that's not what I thought, right? I mean, he could actually see for the first time and he's walking through and people are saying, hey, aren't you the guy who was uh, disabled right there on the, on the road? Yep, that's me. Oh no, that can't be him. It looks like him, but that's not him. No, I am he. And it cre created such a stir that they went to the Pharisees and said, hey, this guy's been healed by some guy. We don't know who did it. So they had a trial. This is an interesting trial that happens here. Do you know why I've discovered obeying Christ 
doesn't always lead to peace. Being faithful to Jesus doesn't always lead you in rest. Being faithful and obedient to Christ will lead you into battle at times, in warfare at times. But please understand this, the God of the universe goes with you. He goes before you. He is your light. He lights your path up. Before God, there was just darkness in our lives, but he brings light and he brings substance and he makes you something much stronger than you were before. And so here's this man. He's questioned by the Pharisees and he's like, who did this? Oh, some guy named Jesus. Who do you think he is? He's a prophet. And he says, well, he can't be a prophet. This man is a sinner because he made mud on the Sabbath. He did work, and so he is a sinner. Listen, the Pharisees had such steep laws that if he just spit in the ground and made mud, that was a sin to them. And they were so frustrated by this, so they brought his parents in. And they asked his parents, was this your, is this your son? Yes. Was he born blind? Yes. How can he see? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. You know why they did that? They were afraid of the religious leaders because they could be excommunicated from their church if they vouched for Jesus. So this man who was 40 years old had to stand before them again and they asked him, how were you able to see? And he's like, well, I don't know, why don't you ask him? I've already told you. Do you want to be his disciples? And they got really mad with him. Do you know what these Pharisees' problem was? They were blind. They were so blind. Matter of fact, those three types of blindness I was talking about earlier, their vision was obscured. You know what their vision was obscured by? By their law, by their preconceptions. They saw Jesus, and this is not who they wanted as their Messiah. This is not who they wanted as their king. Their vision was obscured by their own wants and desires. And Christians, our vision today becomes just as obscured because of the very same things. Some of us cannot see clearly because of anger, unforgiveness, and sometimes the biggest thing in our way is ourselves. We're so self-absorbed that we can't even see the hurt and suffering of those around us. Me and Jamie was on a date, and a date in April, and we went to this restaurant, and a lot of people were out on prom night. And so there's like seven or eight like kids at this one big table, and it was dead silent because all the kids were doing this. <laughs> all of them, all the kids were just sitting there. And I remember when, when we went to prom and we were interacting and laughing with our friends and, and having a good, uh, just a wonderful time, and they're just sitting there so isolated around all these people. We can be, become so self-absorbed and things get in the way of our vision that we cannot see where God wants to take us, what God wants to do in our lives. Our vision is obscured. These men, they had selective sight. They only wanted to see what they what? Wanted to see. And, and here's two problems here. Well, one, they were jealous of Jesus. Uh, two, he healed a man on the Sabbath, which is a miracle, but he broke the law in their eyes. And number three, the man could testify to himself that he had been healed, and it was a real miracle. And that was their problems because, listen, they did not want to see Jesus succeed and do well. They had such jealousy and envy towards him. Sometimes we see what we want to because we don't want to admit that there just might be something to it, that God's moving. But we don't want it. There are people who have selected vision when it comes to Jesus even today. There are some people who just want to make Jesus out as this made up or evil entity. But that is not true. They have selected sight. Listen, Jesus, he lived. He's a real man who lived on this earth, but he was so much more than a man. He was the son of God, the very embodiment of God on this earth. God made flesh and was amazing. But they have selected sight. Some people look at the church with selective sight. Sometimes they'll look at the church and they'll, they'll paint the church out as bad because of one or two bad eggs. Listen, one bad egg in a dozen doesn't make the whole dozen rotten, does it? Amen? But sometimes we'll focus on that one issue or that one thing within God's church. And we have selected vision towards it. If one of them is bad, all of them is bad. All Christians are bad. But you see... 
church isn't just about coming to church or being a part of a church. Listen, when you're a Christian, you are the church. You are the church. We can be very selective in what we want to see based on whether or not it pleases us. How many of you have ever heard this statement? Well, so-and-so turned a blind eye. You know what? This idea of favoritism and this idea of disliking somebody to the point that some people you will bend backwards over to please, but then there are some people in your life whom you don't even acknowledge their existence. You see, Jesus, he had an impartial love. He loved who? Everybody. Everyone. And listen, this is the kind of love that every Christian has to try to ascend to. To love everyone as Jesus loves them. Amen. And these, these guys, they were spiritually blind. Jesus stood before them, taught with authority, healed, raised the dead, made a man born blind to see, and they still would not admit the power of God was working. But listen, if they're spiritually blind, there's nothing we can physically do except to engage them spiritually, and that is through prayer. Christians, there's some people in our lives who are spiritually blind. They have a veil over their minds. They can't understand God's word. They can't understand your thinking. The God of this world has blinded them to see the light of Christ. And so you know what we need to do? Well, I want to just rip that veil down, amen? But you know what we're to do? Engage them spiritually and pray for them and love them as Jesus loves them and be everything that you can be the word of God to them. Because they might not ever read God's word, but maybe if we make everything about our life God's word, they can see God's word in action. There are some people who are spiritually blind because God is not ready to reveal to them the next step of their faith. You might be in a place in your faith with Jesus right now, but God, he has, the, he, he has you blinded right now from something, something, because he's preparing you, he's uh, challenging you and growing you for some reason. I love it because in Scripture, Mary Magdalene, she saw Jesus and, and she thought he was the gardener after he was resurrected. And, uh, he's, and she didn't realize until he said, Mary. And then it was like scales fell off her eyes and she saw him for who he was. The two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, they walked with Jesus all day and all night. They, they ate bread with him and when Jesus prayed and broke the bread, their eyes were open and they could see Jesus for the first time. Listen, Christians, if you feel like you're in a moment where you just don't know what you're doing with God, hang in there. God is ready and willing to open your eyes to the next level or area of faith. Just hold on. Sometimes you just got to leave the house like the woman who was hemorrhaging for 12 years and just brave the crowd just to try to touch the hem of Jesus' garments. To just hang in there, Christians. And this blind man, this man who was born blind, tries to teach the teachers. And they said that you are filled with sin. And they dismissed him. Do you know what? Have you ever tried to teach anybody who knows everything? Well, these things called teenagers, right? This, uh, these kids, their granddad, he was the fisherman of fishermen. I mean, this guy, he fished everywhere. I mean, he was an exceptionally amazing fisherman. He loved fish. He breathed going fishing. If he wasn't uh, eating, he was fishing. All right? He just loved it. And, and he couldn't stand because his son really didn't have anything to do with fishing. He couldn't stand it. It made him upset. But you know what? As soon as his son had kids, you know what his goal was? I'm going to make them fishermen. And so as soon as the, the kids got a little older, he, he picked them up from his sons. Like, come on, I'm going to take you fishing. And they were excited. And he was getting them to the, the, the loading area. And he was telling them every little thing that hey, he's ever learned about fishing. He's telling them. And they kept on trying to ask him questions. He was like, stop. Boy, I, I'm trying to talk. And, and they'd say, well, Papa, no, stop. I, I'm trying to tell you something. You know? And they kept on trying to ask him a question. And he kept on cutting them off. And finally finished his big spiel. And he, he's like, Papa. He goes, what, son? I'm trying to teach you about fishing. Your boat's going down the river. <laughs> Whoa! 
It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how much you think you know. God still wants you to grow and learn and to teach others, knowing fully well that even though we might still fail at times, but God is always faithful. He will always sustain you and be your eyes for you at times. Don't you want God's eyes? Matter of fact, it says in Scripture that we are to no longer look at each other from a human point of view, that we are to look at each other as God sees us. Do you know how God sees you? Do you know how God sees you? I, I just envision it like the first time I saw my daughters when they were born. <laughs> it's like I don't even understand how someone could see something that beautiful and deny a creator. And you look at all that beauty, and you're not even thinking about the things that they're going to do to you later, you know? You're not even thinking about that home they're going to stick you in one day, right? You're not thinking about any of those things. All you see is this beautiful creature, and it's so perfect and wonderful, and altogether part of you, and altogether not you at all. It's someone unique, fashioned, and shaped, and no one else will be like them. And God looks at his people and he looks at you the same way. I formed and shaped you. I know your beginning, your end, and I hemmed you in and out. And I know when you sit, stand, and I desperately want to be in your life. Do you see God? Has God opened your eyes to him? We live in a very dark, blind world. But God can use you to bring light to this place. Amen. Would you please stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, as the blind man said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. But one thing I do know, I once was blind. And now I see. And Lord, if there's someone here who's struggling with blindness, maybe it's not a total blindness, but maybe they're just struggling with where they should be at in life. God, may you give them confidence that you are their light, and there is no other like you in their lives. Help us to see you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.